This is Empty Eyes. Everybody say hi. Hi. Uh, he is awesome. Uh, we met at this conference over here uh, um, on, uh, what was it? Um, consumer Packaged Goods, right? Yeah. And uh, we just happened to be both looking for lunch, and we started talking, and he's an expert in data and digital and AI. And he said, you need somebody to guest speak? And I said, hell yes. So he works for a company called Reckitz, which makes everything from Lysol to baby formula. Yep. That's pretty cool. So he's going to give you a whole thing on what he's doing and all the stuff he's talked about. So ask questions, but let's give him another round of applause. Good morning, everyone. Um, so in terms of what we're going to go over today, uh, I've, I'll give you the agenda first, and then we'll cover off specifics. So who am I? How did I get here? Um, what is retail media, and which is what I really focus on right now for a, jo for a job? What is a data clean room, and how does that uh, impact how we do marketing today at a, as a, at a global CPG? Uh, thirdly, I'll show you, uh, fourthly, I'll show you a case study in terms of uh, how we're using uh, a data clean room, and then I'll give you some takeaways from there. Cool. So firstly, who is Reckitt? Reckitt is a multinational uh, CPG. Uh, we have a whole heap of brands across multiple categories. So if you think about the business, there's three parts to the business. One is infant nutrition, so baby formula, which is where I work. Um, we also have a household cleaning business, so we make everything from finished dishwashing tablets to Airwick to Lysol uh, as well. Uh, and we also have a personal care and healthcare business as well, so everything from Mucinex, Delsum, um, Airborne, etc. Okay? So, in me in particular, uh, I've been with the company. Uh, since I was 20 years old. I started it in Sydney, Australia, um, and have moved across the world with, with Racket. So in terms of my experience, I started on the field um, as a grad uh, with Racket. Um, and then I moved into sales operations, which means uh, looking at the field teams that we have, selling our products into customers all across Australia. I then moved into account management, which means maintaining our rela business relationships um, with the likes of Woolworths and Coles back in Australia. And then this thing called, uh, and a bit of tr uh, trade and shopper marketing in there as well, but then this thing called e-commerce pops up for about nine or 10 years ago, which was relatively new uh, to the CPG space. And I was kind of pushed into that role by, by senior leadership in Australia, not because I knew anything about digital marketing or e-commerce, uh, but because I was good at PowerPoint and Excel. Um, so you know, right place, right time, and, and right opportunity. Uh, from there, uh, I was the first e-commerce manager in Australia, uh, and we launched uh, new business models. So, you know, Racket is traditionally a B2B, so we sell to other retailers who then sell on to other customers or our consumers. Uh, I was then setting up new business models like direct-to-consumer e-commerce. So how do we cut out retailers uh, and then ship directly to consumers and then market directly to uh, consumers using things like Facebook and Google. Uh, then I got shipped to uh, the UK, uh, where I was in a global role. So in global, we look at, you know, how, how can we support multiple markets um, from cross-market learnings and scale up things that are working and then scale things that aren't working. So, you know, if, for example, China uh, is very, very advanced when it comes to e-commerce, if you think about Alibaba and uh, Timu, et cetera. Uh, how do we take some of those learnings from China uh, and then you know, apply them into other, other markets as well? Uh, from, from a global role, uh, I transitioned into specializing in direct-to-consumer e-commerce, which is where I've been uh, for about four years of my career thus far, uh, both in looking after Europe from a regional role, uh, as well as moving to the US at the height of the pandemic in March of 2020. Uh, looking after baby formula uh, in that time as well. So, you know, in this transition that I've had from, you know, going to school uh, in, at the University of Sydney studying commerce and marketing, and then transitioning into a sales career, and then transitioning into an e-commerce career, uh, through the D2C experience, I've also had to pick up a lot of uh, technical stuff when it comes to understanding software and understanding how to use technology. And now I look after performance media. And what performance media is, is looking at media, but specifically within Amazon, Walmart, Target, and how do we actually directly market to consumers on those platforms and get them to purchase. So 
it's not DTC anymore, it's looking at total e-commerce marketing, um, but at, at the retailers in particular. So that's you know, my corporate experience on, on one half of a slide. On the right hand side, beyond corporate, um, I, am, I have a, uh, a podcast called Applied Intelligence where I talk about generative AI and the applications of that uh, within uh, the CPG space. I also do some stuff with uh, Harvard Business Review in terms of um, contributing into generative AI content. I have some passions around startups uh, as well. Uh, there's a thing called Startup Bus. You guys should Google that. Everyone should do uh, the Startup Bus competition. I'm not going to go into it detail today, but it's basically a hackathon on a bus where you build a business in 72 hours, launch it, pitch it, and then get going from there. So even if you don't do the business, the whole learning experience that you get from that process is super valuable to anyone uh, doing growth marketing, marketing today. Okay, cool. So if you think about the CPG category uh, or the C CPG industry vertical over the last, uh, let's call it five to 10 years, it's gone through two massive shifts. The first one is in uh, distribution. Uh, if you think, let's say 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, it was all about brick and mortar sales. If you're talking about CPG goods, um, every category was being bought at a physical retail location. Over the last 10 years, e-commerce has taken off. Amazon's taken off here in uh, the US. Um, Alibaba and, and the likes have taken off everywhere across the world. But now what we're coming to is a place where, from a marketing point of view, we're thinking not just about the digital retail where a lot of the growth has come from over the last few years, but we're thinking about the holistic journey of consumer uh, when it comes to where are they actually shopping from, right? So when the pandemic kicked off, um, you know, people like Instacart or companies like Instacart, by the way, the, the two founders of um, Instacart met on Startup Bus as well, um, fun fact. But we're thinking about the holistic consumer journey. What are those digital media or marketing uh, that are touching the consumers along that journey and where are they actually shopping it? Uh, where are they actually making that purchase? So we don't just care about, you know, did they purchase online or did they purchase in offline? What are those touch points in that consumer journey that we can actually expose media to and we actually can influence uh, to make them buy our brand versus somebody else's brand? The second piece uh, here is that digital revolution uh, when it comes to uh, media. So, you know, 50 years ago, uh, reach and frequency media across uh, television, print, radio, you didn't really know who, who uh, you were marketing to or the, who the, those actual consumers were. Uh, you just knew the, the audience title. So, you know, people who watch the news at 7 p.m. have a certain um, demographic profile. That's what you were buying from a media point of view. Digital kind of changed that with, with the likes of Facebook and Google in terms of, you know, getting clearer I, um, signals in terms of who people are. So someone who's typing in baby formula on Google is obviously very important to, or is obviously very interested in, in buying baby formula or interested in understanding what baby formula is about. We didn't have those signals when we were doing analog media before. And now this, this third wave is retail media, which is you know, an interaction of both media and shopping in the one place. So Amazon is not, just a, uh, is not just a shop. It's not just a place where you buy stuff. It's also a place where you're being influenced to buy stuff as well through media. And Amazon owns lots of things like Prime Video, there's a football, uh, Freebie, et cetera, and is becoming a much bigger media organization uh, and, and not just a retail destination as well. And similarly, think, you know, if you think about retailers like Walmart, this is why they're doing uh, re media partnerships with the likes of uh, Paramount Plus, um, Roku, et cetera, as well. So retailers are evolving and digitizing their, not just their store footprint, um, but also their media footprint and how they uh, influence consumers. Cool. So delving deeper into what a, uh, what a retail media network is, um, if you think about the major retailers here in the US, um, all of these retailers have uh, a wealth uh, of first party data. They have transactional data on who is purchasing, 
what at their uh, physical stores as well as their digital stores. And even more on digital, right? When you're when you've signed into <clears throat> when you're signed into your Walmart app or your Amazon app, they know everything about who you are, where you live, what frequency are you buying certain products, um, what frequency are you seeing certain ads before you've actually made that um, purchase. So for us as a CPG, there are certain media tactics that we play um, across you know, the retail media ecosystem, um, starting with page search. So when you're typing in baby formula, for example, on, on Amazon, or you're typing in any product category that's relevant to one of my brands, um, I'm trying to actively um, make sure that my product appears at the top of the page so you click it. The higher up on the page that you are, the more likely that you are to be clicked, um, the more likely you are to, to win that search, right? The second part of it is uh, targeted display and video ads as well. Similarly on Amazon, uh, when you're making that search, uh, or when you're interested in a particular category and you haven't converted, you'll start to notice that those ads, those visual ads are following you around the internet, um, trying, to, trying to get you to convert. So the retail media network has seen the signal that you have searched, but you did not purchase within a certain time frame. So companies are actively advertising to you, trying to make you convert into, into that brand. And then thirdly, um, what is this actually um, doing for us as a CPG is giving us a whole heap of customer insights that we never had before, right? So again, remind, remember I told you, you know, we've always used to be a B2B type company. We've always had retailers uh, maintain that relationship with consumer when it comes to transaction and purchase. That data now is way more accessible to us than it was ever before. So we're actively mining that data and trying to find use cases and uses of that uh, in order to continue to grow our brands. And then finally is uh, data clean rooms. Uh, and we're gonna go into um, more detail in the following slides, but basically what's happening now is there's a framework or a technology available for us for brands to take their first party data, so the data that we have on our customers, match it in a compliant way with retail media data uh, and then activate that accordingly. And we'll go into detail uh, in, in the case study. So what are clean rooms and how do they work? So on the right hand side of this chart over here, um, you have retail media networks. So data clean rooms are places where ad publishers, so Google, Meta, Facebook, um, as well as Amazon now, as well as uh, Walmart Connect, um, they're sharing their aggregated data rather than their customer level data um, with advertisers such as myself, um, whilst exerting strict control. Because you can't, Walmart, when you're signed up to Walmart or when you're signed up to Amazon, um, in the privacy agreement, you're agreeing that, uh, or sorry, Walmart is agreeing that they're not going to share your data with somebody else um, in a very explicit manner, right? There's privacy controls in place. So in terms of that first party data, um, to match that compliantly with a brand advertiser um, such as myself, it's, that data is actually put into a clean room. What that means is all of your, I, all of your personal information is hashed uh, in a way that I can't identify who you are, but I can use certain signals and understand certain behaviors that you have on that platform uh, to match up to my data, okay? So say for example, um, I wanna look at, uh, over the last 30 days, I want to see um, people who searched for Nike shoes uh, but did not purchase. Okay, so keyword Nike shoes did not purchase. I can go into the data clean room and create an audience of people that search for that keyword but did not purchase. And the data clean room will give me back an audience of 2,000 or 20,000 identities. I don't know who these people are. Um, but I know that they had a certain behavior on that retail media network, and then I can advertise against them, okay? Um, so from there, we see how different data sets match up um, and look at any inconsistencies between the two um, to understand if we're over-serving ads, if we're giving too many ads away, um, or you know, what activity do we actually need to run? So the three ways that you can um, use a data clean room. One is through measurement. So you can look at historical performance of your ads uh, within that retail media network. You can 
use it also for media planning. So if I change the, the media tactics that I've done, what, what happens? It's like a scenario planning situation. And then you can also use it uh, on the fly. So from a media activation point of view, which is where uh, the case study is going to head. Cool, I think I've covered this one. So to, to make it really easy, um, a data clean room is akin to a middle school dance. So on, on the left, side, left hand side here, you have your own or your brand or the advertiser's uh, first party data. On the right, se right hand side there, you've got someone else's first party data, right? And there is a heavily chaperoned temporary interaction happening in between them, okay? Um, so after you've done that interaction, everyone goes back to the wall. And remember, who owns the gym isn't as important as, you know, what you're dancing to and the music, what, what the music is, right? So this is a, a very new way for advertisers or, or CPGs uh, for us to match our data with other people's data uh, in a compliant way and activate against it, okay? Guys, if you have any questions throughout my slides, please, please feel free to uh, ask as well. So uh, the retailer that's leading uh, data clean room activation here in the US is Amazon. Uh, Amazon has a product uh, called Amazon Marketing Cloud. Uh, and in this case study, we'll go over um, some of the things what we've done with them. So the objective of, of, the, um, of this initiative was to shoot more bullseyes with um, our media, right? If you think about the baby formula category, um, if you don't have a baby, you're not interested in this category. Um, so there's no point of me exposing my ads to people that don't have a baby. In the US, there are 10,000 babies being born every day, and then there are 10,000 babies leaving this product category every day. There's only like 1% um, birth rate growth in the US, so like, and breastfeeding is increasing. So from a volume point of view, there's no volume growth in this category. It is all about uh, how do I acquire more customers from other people's brands, as well as uh, how do I extend that lifetime value uh, within people that have bought my brand as well. So in terms of the how, what we did was create weekly cohorts from our own database, from our own uh, first party data that we have, uh, and we put them into Amazon Marketing Cloud and delivered sequential ads to these consumers. Uh, and we measured the difference in uh, conversion uh, versus uh, control groups. Um, previously. We also uh, built lookalikes within the Amazon um, audience layer as well to find shoppers that had similar sorts of behaviors as well um, to further get to more consumers. So in terms of um, how we activated this, so we did a specific, um, we did some specific campaigns around our infant uh, vitamins portfolio. Um, so consumers that fell into um, the audience behaviors that we were looking at would deserve display creative across. Uh, we started with our vitamins range, that we, then we moved on to, to baby formula as well, but to give you some perspective of some of the ads uh, that people were looking at. And then what were we optimizing and testing against? So as a performance marketer, I really want to drive two things. One is I want to drive purchase. I want more, I want more people to buy my brand. And secondly, I want to optimize against cost, which means I want to spend less money acquiring uh, those customers into my brand, right? So the way uh, this, this kind of works is across the three, these three vectors or th these three levers, um, we were either upweighting or downweighting things to, to find the optimal way to acquire, cust acquire new customers, 10,000 babies every day, uh, acquire more of those co customers in the most cost-effective way possible, okay? So how do you kind of do that? So firstly, you start with audience. Who is the right audience to target? So you go into the data clean room, you look at um, what are these behaviors that people display when they're shopping on Amazon, for example. Um, search is a very good one, right? Um, because if you've searched in the last 30 days for baby formula or you've searched in the last 30 days for um, a particular, sure, go ahead. Um, so it's just about what is the right budget to spend? How do you, what's the process for that? Like how do you find the right budget? Um, if it's not given. You start with a seed budget. You start with, I don't know, $10,000 a week, for example, uh, and you see the performance against that. And if you want to scale that up or down, you can. 
So you, you just start somewhere. Uh, obviously, it, it needs to make sense for that category, right? So if you're in a billion dollar category, you'd spend a lot more money than if you were in a category. And if your brand is only like a million dollars big or $10 million big, your advertising budget would be significantly different versus someone who's you know, shipping billions of dollars worth of product, right? So you just gotta pick a number that, that kind of makes financial sense for you to start with. And then based on that performance, you can scale up or down. Um, so you start with audience. So what are those signals that you can take out of that retail media network? Um, so search is one of them, but you could also think about things like, you know, if someone's buying um, Lululemon gym pants, they might also be interested in sweatshirts from Lululemon, for example. So you go think about what are those uh, correlations between behavior on a, uh, on a platform and then create that audience and then test against it. So right budget, um, so to your question, you start with something and you see if you need to scale it up or down. Um, but also what's very cool about this is um, the machine is actively making decisions on, do I spend my entire budget today? Like that $10,000, if I'm spending, let's say $20,000 a day right now, do I spend that all of it today? Or do I hold on to some of that budget and optimize for total sales, right? So it's not just about spending your marketing dollars today, it's also thinking about what's the best way to spend my dollars so I get the maximum return. Uh, and then finally is settings. So when you're setting up Amazon campaigns, um, you can do things like frequency caps. So what a frequency cap is, is the number of times somebody is exposed to an ad, right? So let's say uh, for a particular category, if you are exposed to nine or more ads, anything above nine doesn't increase conversion anymore. So why would we want to do a frequency of 20 if that has no impact? So I can cut down my frequency and cap um, the number of times that the same person sees the same creative uh, and save money and, and you know, show my ad to somebody else. So the machine was doing all of this stuff for us. To look at how the, that model actually works, um, so on the left-hand side there, we have our CDP. A CDP is basically a, a database where all of our first-party consumer information sits. The second part is we looked at Amazon ads. We looked at our, how our historical campaign performance was happening. And then within our media platform, so we use a specific software to buy our media, uh, we're looking at the audience reports. All of this information uh, was fed into our ad optimization model. Uh, which processed all of this information, created new campaigns for us. It uh, served those ads into Amazon ads. It monitored the performance of those ads in real time. And then that information gets sent back into the optimization model and it continually optimizes on the fly. So it's using machine learning to do all of those three things that we talked about in the previous slide in real time on the fly with real budget at all times, right? So instead of me having to have multiple um, performance media managers sitting there, like up weighting certain budgets, down weighting budgets, looking at which audiences to create and all of these n number of things that they could be doing, the machine is doing that for us because machines are better at process driven tasks versus humans, right? Any questions on this slide? No? All right. So, what did, it, what did it achieve? Um, so across the key metrics that we were tracking for this particular case study, um, we saw significant improvement. Um, on the first KPI, which is purchase per dollar spent, uh, what purchases per dollar means is for every dollar that I spend, how many transactions did I get from, from that, right? So if, um, you know, in the benchmark periods, we were getting very low um, conversions per dollar spent. Uh, versus when we were looking at the cumulative performance uh, in the case study, uh, we significantly improved against the baseline. Uh, uh, in terms of purchase rate, which you could also, is, is similar to your conversion rate in terms of um, total, uh, total sales coming across from a conversion point of view, that increased as well. And then finally, when we look at a return on ad spend, it, which is your sales divided by your ad spend, it significantly improved as well. So across, um, from a 
you know, result point of view in, in performance media, this is exactly what you want to see. You want to see higher sales and you want to see lower cost, right? Because typically when you scale spend, especially in the old world of traditional media, uh, your performance drops very quickly um, because you've already, if you've already, if you're already spending too much money, spending that next dollar might not necessarily be a good thing. Um, this model kind of showed us, you know, on some of our product categories, we were already spending too much money. It didn't improve our sales, but it cut our marketing in half, meaning that I could take that savings and then spend it somewhere else. So, to some takeaways. Um, so, by using a clean, data clean room, you can deliver that right creative to that right audience at the right time. You can optimize your media and optimize what ads you're showing to uh, everyone in real time. And you can do all of that through uh, AI and automation at scale as well. So what does that mean for, for you? So if I was in your shoes, um, what I would be focusing on right now is how and understanding how data flows through multiple things or multiple pieces within an organization across uh, sales, across marketing, across consumer insights, across all of these things. Um, so improve your data fluency. Um, I would also learn how to st start small and cheap and then walk away if it doesn't. And this is something I learned by doing Startup Bus, by the way. Um, but this project that we started off, you know, initially we didn't know if it was going to work. It was a very big risk that it wasn't going to work. Um, but we thought, what's the cheapest way uh, to get started, what is the smallest category that we can kind of get, you know, throw a little bit of money that wouldn't hurt us uh, to get started with and see if it works. And then you can scale up from there and ask for more money from the business. And then finally, always be learning, which is, you know, this stuff didn't exist when I was, uh, when I was in college. I also, um, I also took a, a data science course through Harvard online uh, a couple of years ago because, you know, when I studied marketing and commerce, uh, data science wasn't really a big thing back then, right? But now it's a very important thing to uh, learn as well. Cool. That's it from me. Any questions? Yeah. What was the project on the Start Bus? What was my project? Yeah. Okay. So this is back in 2014 before Co Pokemon Go made um, uh, AR, like augmented reality, a thing. So my, my team... Uh, we made this thing called Spexy-Me, which is custom designed 3D printed glasses using augmented reality from your uh, webcam um, laptop. So yeah, so we actually built a functioning product. Uh, I had a girl on the team, she was 20 years old, Atlassian had already hired her. Uh, she found uh, Ray-Ban had some open source software allowing you to put glasses on someone's face in a, within the browser. This is like nine years ago. This is like revolutionary at the time. Um, another person who was a mechanical engineer, um, he found in-browser CAD. Uh, so we were customizing the look and feel of the glasses. And another person on the team who uh, was building e-commerce sites, so he built a functioning website. Um, and then a girl from Spectrum PR who managed uh, the PR for Samsung in Australia, and she did all of our content marketing. Uh, she got us into 3D printing news, uh, and we did all of this with dodgy Wi-Fi, traveling from Sydney to Melbourne, which is about seven, eight hundred miles, um, and back uh, in in three days. So, you know, if you want to build stuff using technology, uh, it's it's very accessible now to do, and with ChatGPT with all of these no-code solutions as well. I think it's really important to understand the problem you're going to solve for consumer or your target market uh, more than it is the technology. The technology now is just becoming even more and more accessible. It's, I don't want to say it's not important to learn code or not important to learn data fluency or data science, um, but the bigger challenge that we have is how do we actually create stuff that's going to get used and make money and add value. Yes. Can you go on back to that slide that has like three different circles? Yep. Um, in terms of like jobs and how that works through your team, like, yeah, that one. Um, like, is it all just a one person job? Like, how does it flow through like your company? And 
great question. Um, so there were two teams uh, that were really instrumental in making this happen. One was my performance media team, and the second team was our data partner. Um, so an external agency that we worked very closely with. Uh, so we had three dedicated data scientists, a, uh, a business analyst, and a, like a project manager. Uh, who kind of orchestrated all of the technical stuff, all the data science, building the product, understanding and connecting the uh, APIs and the data points. And then a commercial person or a marketing person who had to clearly define the problem that we were trying to solve and what the output kind of needed to look like, right? So again, you know, the technical stuff, there's a lot of technical people out there in the world, um, but Clearly defining the problem that you're trying to solve is the tricky stuff, uh, which you know everyone in this room can do. Like, how do you determine when to change the previously like defined parameters or like change the benchmark? Okay, um, good question. And this is this comes down to studying your category and studying your brand and studying your competitors, right? So. For example, um, if your competitor comes in and starts spending twice as much as you do for no apparent reason within a particular category, you have to respond to that, right? Um, but you need to know that they've done something. So on a, uh, on a monthly, bi-weekly, and then quarterly basis as well, we monitor our market share. We look at uh, how are our brands performing against all of the competitors and the total market. And if there is a significant change, we determine what do we need to do about that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. Um, when you have like an industry that's built, like you have a very defined like customer lifetime. Yes. Um, so how much of like when you're looking at data and like deciding how to go on, how much of it is focused on like new customer acquisition for like the 10,000 babies entering like every single day versus you know like trying to take people away from competitors and like get your market share that way? Sure. Um, great question, by the way, because I've worked in the baby formula category is very different to most of CPG, right? If you think of CPG, toilet paper, um, uh, yogurt, all these other different categories where, you know, promo, so price, uh, your, four, your traditional four Ps play a huge part of your um, purchasing decision, right? Um, baby formula is different because you're buying this one category for nine months and you're spending between 400 to 1200 dollars in nine months that's a lot of money versus toilet paper an average household might spend i don't know 120 to 150 dollars on toilet paper uh on a on an annual basis which is completely different and is heavily influenced by who's on promo that week for example right so it comes down to understanding those shopping behaviors that we talked about what are, what is that path to purchase uh, in terms of choosing the brand that you're going to go with or and what priority does brand have um, and what priority does media have in that equation to actually uh, make a purchase, right? So let's say uh, I'm picking on, and this is a hypothetical example. I don't know the toilet paper category in the US that well. Um, but let's say media doesn't matter in that equation, right? It doesn't matter who... Um, is doing as many display ads as possible. The customer only cares about who is on promotion this week. Yeah, then promotion is more important than media. So then you have to change your strategy and really, you know, compete against your competitors who might be on promotion every single week, and then determine how do I differentiate myself against everybody else. Baby form is completely different. Highly emotional category. Um, doctors healthcare professionals, your midwives, everyone has a huge part to play in terms of um, making the decision of which brand you'll pick for your baby. Um, so yeah, the answer is it depends. Um, do you mostly target or like focus on um, getting new or acquiring new customers or is it like once you're a customer, stick, stick with it? Is that the experience? I don't know much about baby formula. You yep. said nine months, I don't know. Is that the only time you've used baby formula and then which is more so of your experience is that once a customer has become a customer of yours, they stay for the nine months or they experiment with it friends where you just spend money on and keep keeping them there. Them. So this is like the general customer behavior within baby formula. Um, so you get when you, 
uh, when you're at hospital and if you're having feeding issues, um, the hospital will typically give you a, a formula. Um, and all of the companies are trying to uh, be that formula of choice at hospital because that's the first interaction that we have. We also, we all do sampling programs as well. So we actually sample products uh, to, to, to the home as well. Um, so we want to be that brand that's there at that moment of need, right? Um, secondly, what happens is one in three babies in the US has a feeding issue, uh, which means a digestive issue, cow's milk allergy, uh, intolerance to something, whatnot. So one in three babies are switching within the, in the first, let's call it 60, in the first 60 odd days, right? Um, and sometimes people switch twice depending on the severity of the, the food allergy or the intolerance to the formula. After that, after baby is comfortable with the formula, switching behavior is not there anymore. It's a very high, a highly loyal category. So for us, even though you might have uh, a nine month baby who can still drink formula um, for another three months or another six months, um, once you've bought the same formula for 90 days, you're not gonna switch. I don't need to market to you anymore. I'm not gonna convince you to buy anything else. Again, it comes back to understanding your category dynamics and understanding how your uh, consumer is buying into your category and what can you actually do to, to change that. Yeah, if you guys want to learn more or reach out, anything, please do.